Hello and welcome to the conference session entitled Power and Projections of Trauma in the 19th and 20th Centuries. My name is Lisa Bear Sarfati, though some of you may know me already as historiographer, and I will be chairing the session. Power and Projections of Trauma in the 19th and 20th Centuries looks at the ways in which the crush of disaster and upheaval disproportionately fall upon people in oppressed or marginalized groups. This panel focuses on the creation of records by those with social or political power that are then used to describe the experiences of those without it, robbing these persons of their own voices in the process. It deals with themes of power, propaganda, control, and marginalization, which will be explored in depth by our speakers during the session's roundtable discussion. It is my great pleasure then to introduce the first of our four speakers today. Adam Franti earned his master's degree in history from Eastern Michigan University in 2018, focusing on military and cultural history of North America. He will be presenting his paper, His Gallant Soul Had Fled, Death, Remembrance, and Race in Early America. Okay, hello. Um, so as introduced, my paper is about primarily covering um, the War of 1812 and two deaths of famous military leaders uh, during that war. And I'm gonna take some time just to introduce that conflict, but uh, first I kind of want to set sort of the stage here. So uh, in the early 20th century, when uh, American soldiers were fighting in the Philippine uh, insurrection, quote unquote, um, one of the popular songs that had been a, a sort of a, a rewrite of a civil war song included the line, civilize them with a crag. Uh, crag being the service rifle of the time and to civilize them, of course, being in reference to the Filipinos they were fighting. And this is a, a theme sort of repeated in a kind of popular sense that dates back to the earliest conflicts that Americans or Proto-Americans or European colonists had had with Native Americans on the continent. And it's sort of a through line um, throughout this entire history of conflict between Native Americans and Americans and even between Europeans and anyone who they viewed as barbaric or of a lesser civilization or uh, any kind of similar theme like that, right? And it has a, a ton of these sort of intellectual and historical and scientific ideas that run behind it that filter down into the popular imagination so much so that they're even part of drama and plays and poems and movies and even podcasts and things like that today. But uh, we're going to talk about the death of Tecumseh, who was a Shawnee chieftain during the War of 1812, and the death of uh, Sir Isaac Brock. Uh, both of them were killed within a year of each other uh, toward the beginning of the War of 1812. And before we go on, I just want to take a minute or so to talk a little bit about what the War of 1812 was actually about, because I find that uh, especially Americans tend not to know too much about the war. Um, and really, there are three major elements of it. And the first two have mostly to do with the idea of American um, sovereignty and sort of international respect. And they have uh, problems with the British naval tactics, essentially, in trying to defeat Napoleon, which was a war that had been going on for quite a long time at that point. And uh, the British were trying to staff their ships. The, the Royal Navy was the largest navy in the entire world, and it took hundreds of sailors on each ship, and they had dozens and dozens of ships. And one of their practices was what they called impressment, which meant that they would just take people that didn't have a job or uh, were poor or couldn't find a place to be employed somewhere else, and they would stuff them into a ship. Uh, this, of course, didn't make for very great sailors, so one of their other tactics was to go through and capture ships that were sailing around, especially neutral ships with Americans on board, and they would search them for Royal Navy deserters or former British citizens or current British citizens. Uh, and this, they, they unfairly targeted Americans, according to American. That was sort of point one. Uh, point two was some uh, embargo politics that were going on on the continent, uh, preventing Americans from freely trading with the French or the British or the Spanish or whoever else. Uh, that was point number two. And point number three is sort of more pertinent to our discussion is what they term generally the Indian problem. Uh, this was cast away uh, in a very similar way as we'll see uh, from kind of the theme of the rest of this talk uh, as being part of the British plan to undermine American power on the continent. But in reality, it was a, uh, a native led rejuvenation project and an Indian led sort of pan Indian movement. Uh, this was not the first or the last uh, but it was one of the most sort of prominent and one of the most successful uh, in, in the history of the continent. So the Shawnee leader Tecumseh ended up becoming one of the, the more prominent native leaders of the entire conflict. And his death in October of 1813 um, was met with pretty much immediate sense that this was a, a, a death that would change the war. But the way that he's treated is markedly different from the way that Isaac Brock's death was treated, which just a year earlier. Uh, and 
just very, very quickly, um, Tecumseh was killed in a battle called the Battle of the Thames or the Battle of Moravian Town. Uh, he was, uh, he had convinced the British leader to stop and face the Americans who had just invaded Canada. And in the course of this battle, he was killed. Now, one of the immediate and kind of most uh, important elements of Tecumseh's death that contrasts with the death of Isaac Brock and other white leaders was that there was almost an immediate uh, spat between people who claimed that they were the one that pulled the trigger. They were the one that killed Tecumseh. These were all Americans, of course, and this included guys like Richard Mentor Johnson, who eventually became the vice president of the United States, and partially he was elected and you know, he became politically prominent because he had the reputation of being an Indian killer. He was a person who was credited generally with killing Tecumseh, one of the most famous Native American chiefs of all time. Uh, contrast this to Isaac Brock. Uh, so the death of Isaac Brock uh, was treated with this kind of trope-laden literary uh, element that characterized the death of like Admiral Nelson, his famous death in the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Brock was uh, lionized. Brock was uh, written about in newspapers and in letters and in other popular accounts as kind of being this hero, this sort of um, very large, larger than life figure, uh, kind of classic British military leader um, who had been killed, you know, in the midst of leading a charge. And the literary tropes that kind of attach this are all centered on Brock's experience. What did Brock feel when he died? What did Brock feel like when he was leading the charge? What were his last words? Did he know what the result of the battle was? Did he know um, the, the sort of disposition of his troops? Did his death inspire his troops to go win the battle? Things like that. And this kind of uh, reflects in almost every single writing of every single death of every single prominent white leader in wars throughout the long 18th century, um, which is very, very, very different, again, from the way that uh, that Tecumseh was treated. So one of the, the most interesting passages uh, was a letter written by a soldier who actually saw Tecumseh's body laying on the battlefield. And in this letter, he describes how Tecumseh looks. He was very handsome, uh, how the disposition of his clothing, how neat his body looked. And toward the end, he even writes that uh, he was lying there in such a handsome manner that I forgot he was a savage, which has a really strange parallel to that song, civilize them with a crack, right? Because if the, the idea being that we lionize the death of white leaders because they're kind of playing the same game that we are, right? They're on the same sort of civilizational level. Uh, as a white person, we understand what they're coming from and we understand their experience. And so we honor it. We honor it by saying they were brave or they were good leader. They were um, remembered well. Whereas with the Native American, they're not the same. Uh, they're on rungs of the of the quote unquote the civilizational ladder a couple of layers low. Um, so saying that death civilizes them is essentially the same as saying you know nits make lice. The only good Indian is a dead Indian. We have an entire century of uh, especially American military leaders using the same language to discuss uh, the death of Native Americans because this was something that is just an uh, sometimes unfortunate and sometimes necessary element of civilizing the continent, right? They were obstacles. They were they're viewed as almost natural obstacles rather than people. And we can see the same things even going back to the 17th century during uh, the middle of the King Philip's War, uh, where Metacom, uh, King Philip by another name, wa was also killed. And his death was treated in the same way. We know who, who killed uh, Metacom. Uh, he was actually what they called a praying Indian at the time. He was somebody who spoke English and um, was uh, fighting with the, the white side of King Philip's war. And he was the one that shot King Philip. We know that, right? But we don't know who killed Isaac Brock. And to an extent, we don't care because Isaac Brock's death is something that it was just the, of course, we expect him to die in this sort of noble, gallant manner. Whereas the the, the death of a Native American needs somebody to have done it. It needs a white person or somebody connected to uh, sort of white civilization to have done it. And if it's another Native American, even better, because that means that our civil, civilizing project is working, right? And some of the plays that talk about uh, the death of, of Tecumseh, and there are actually plays that talk about the death of Metacom as well, and this is a, a, a literary genre unto itself, um, talk about both of these men as extinct animals. Um, one of the, the one of the long kind of uh, very boring, to be honest, <laughs> um, uh, poems and plays about the death of Tecumseh actually likens him to uh, passing from the world like the mammoth that used to tramp around the Kentucky hills uh, or something like that. And it 
connects to the idea of the disappearing race that became very popular in uh, especially the 1920s, um, that these were people that were just doomed to disappear. They were gone. They were going to leave. Uh, they were never going to come back. And it was sort of uh, Americans' job to not only hasten that along, but also document it, right? Because what a tragedy for this history to disappear from the world, even if blatantly and at every single level from American politics to warfare to pop culture, understands that the American project is civilizing Native Americans by killing them, right? And we can see this kind of uh, this thing, kind of the through line going through all of the experience of um, Europeans against Native Americans in all of the conflicts that date back to the founding of the early colonies. And the, the last difference I want to talk about is um, that the way the bodies are treated is also very telling um, and probably could have taken up the bulk of this uh, conversation. But um, Metacom, King Philip, uh, and Tecumseh were both mutilated. Uh, individuals, uh, not necessarily under orders or anything like that, but individuals who wanted literally to take a piece of this famous person home with them uh, went and cut pieces off of their bodies. Uh, there was a trade uh, among the New England colonies in the 17th century that claimed to have finger bones or skulls or the jaw or teeth of Metacom. And the same sort of thing happened with Tecumseh. There are stories about uh, Tecumseh having been uh, had strips of his skin taken off to turn into uh, belts or razor straps. And you can probably guess that the same thing did not happen to Isaac Brock or to General Wolfe or to Admiral Nelson, right? They were treated with respect and with dignity because they're part of the same civilizing project, right? They're sitting at the same rung of that ladder of civilization and they don't need to be civilized. They already are. Whereas death and mutilation and the desecration of the memory is a major portion of what Americans uh, and, you know, prior uh, white colonists uh, had thought was part of the point of living on this, this continent and their kind of work and destiny within the continent as well. So essentially, there's, uh, we could go on for a long time, but I think the takeaway here is that uh, these literary dimensions of the death of famous people uh, have the sort of residue that filters even down to the popular culture of the time. And you cannot separate this sort of um, kind of the hideous policies of the American government from the just popular understanding of what the American project was, even down to a level of a, of a simple soldier in the 20th century. Thank you, Adam, for drawing our attention to these interesting disparities between the posthumous treatment of indigenous and white leaders. Our next speaker today is Katie Truax, who holds a master's degree from the University of Edinburgh, specializing in the history of medicine. She currently works for Lone Star College in Texas. She will be presenting her paper dealing with catastrophe, medical men, and the diseases of women in 19th century Britain. The history of gynecology and the study of women's diseases in the 19th century is fraught with controversy and debate. Some of the most prominent practitioners, including J. Marion Sims, considered to be the father of minor gynecology, made their advancements in the field at the expense of those they practiced upon. In the case of Sims, he developed techniques on unanesthetized slave women, including performing controversial surgeries and inviting spectators. In the case of Isaac Baker Brown, who practiced in London, uh, he performed clitoridectomies, the removal of the clitoris as a cure for physical, mental, or moral disturbances without the consent of many of his patients. Uh, the history of gynecology in the 19th century, however, is not a straightforward tale of exploitation, but rather a murky morass of moral expectations, medical reputations, the developing field of medical professionalism, deviant female bodies, and genuine suffering for sick women. This paper will focus on ovarian dropsy as a general category for swelling caused by cysts and tumors of the ovary in the first half of the 19th century. In 19th century Britain, medical men were choosing to practice on gynecological issues with some authority compared to previous years, although they were held in low regard by physicians of less taboo areas and were not always trusted by their patients. Concerns about reputation and their ability to make money would drive many of their actions. Women's bodies and the outcomes of birth had become more important to the state in recent years and to scientific inquiry um, and there were also growing numbers of medical, organizational, and regulatory bodies, as well as professional societies and publications. Uh, one such publication was The Lancet. One of the major sources for this paper, The Lancet is a medical journal that began publishing in 1824 
and is a reflection of and contributed to the increasing sense of professional identity for medical men at the time. The Lancet published the articles they felt would be most useful to the medical community, selecting important lectures, cases, correspondence, reviews, and debates. Hospital reports were published weekly, along with occasional reports on death statistics. Practitioners of medicine might have several reasons to write to and be published in the Lancet. To establish a positive reputation in the field by contributing to the collective knowledge, uh, to report about novel treatments of their own invention that were performing well, uh, and to record interesting cases and outcomes. Ovarian dropsy and ovarian disease certainly produced interesting cases. Dropsy presented as a swollen abdomen, uh, sometimes as large as and often mistaken for a full-term pregnancy. One of the most popular treatments, paracentesis, provided a spectacle as the physician tapped the patient by piercing the skin with a hollow trocar containing a cannula and then withdrawing the trocar, causing a dramatic gush of liquid that made a woman as large as if she was just going to lie in, uh, become as flat as a man or a maiden. The clear relief and immediate change in physical appearance impressed patients, families, and fellow doctors alike. So why then is ovarian dropsy an appropriate topic for a conference about catastrophe and chaos and a panel about trauma and power? The catastrophe lies in the inevitable recurrence of the dropsy and death that followed treatment. The incurability of ovarian dropsy was catastrophic for the women who suffered and could also be catastrophic for the medical men trying to treat uh, the disease if they could not find ways to control the narrative and preserve their reputations. One expert in gynecology, Professor Simpson of Edinburgh, maintained in 1846 that in nine out of 10 cases of ovarian cysts, the disease pursued a regular progress toward enlargement, insufferable distension, local irritation, constitutional exhaustion, and death. The London University Medical Society agreed that, as ovarian dropsy is now considered incurable, some hazard might justifiably be run in its treatment. Physician Congreve Selwyn observed that knowing the disease to be incurable, there are females who would rather try a hazardous proceeding with the chance of a cure than be left to their fate. Physicians would indeed try hazardous treatments, such as the injection of iodine uh, and ovariotomy, but to little avail. This rhetoric of incurability had to be used carefully. One would never mention it in front of patients, lest their faith in the physician be shaken. Medical men had to carefully protect their reputations to maintain their authority and keep their career. Incurable is also not found in any of the case books or letters about cases in progress. It is only in two situations that the term was used. One, when a case was concluded in death, because incurability meant that the death was inevitable and any blame was removed from the physician and their methods. Two, when a patient recovered, the physician could triumph over the catastrophe and take credit for their mastery of death. Isaac Baker Brown uh, was skilled at creating a narrative and using the rhetoric of incurability to shape his reputation and create authority. At the beginning of his career, he adopted a conservative range of treatments already accepted and then claimed that this disease can be cured by a plan free from danger or any ill consequences. Uh, he said this despite his death rates being essentially the same as other practitioners. Physicians debated him about his claim that he could cure the incurable, but this did not expose him and in fact increased his visibility and therefore his reputation and career. Uh, when surgical removal of the ovaries called ovariotomy began to gain more legitimacy, Baker Brown was willing to switch from his previous dislike of the treatment and again claim that he had found a cure. This flew in the face of the overall high death rates uh, that came with the surgery and claims from some that Baker Brown was exaggerating his numbers. Nevertheless, he was recognized as an authority and his career flourished. He was successful in controlling the narrative. It was not until much later, after the 1860s, that the variotomy began to improve death rates in ovarian disease due to improvements in technique and antisepsis. By then, Baker Brown had been drummed out of the field, not due to his practice of clitoridectomies, but due to the damage he did to the reputation of the medical community in conduct that deeply offended professional norms. Uh, this behavior included his pursuit of publicity, a tradesman-like action, and advertising, which, quote, testified to the presence of mercenary concerns unworthy of a gentleman. The chaos surrounding ovarian dropsy can also be seen in the pages of The Lancet. Some believe that ovarian dropsy was a disease unto itself, while others believe that it was merely a symptom of some greater disorder. 
medical men tried to create narratives of progress and control when there was little of either to be had. For example, one leading obstetrician, William Hunter, had said very little in his publications about ovarian dropsy except for the following in 1762. A patient will have the best chance of living longest under it who does the least to get rid of it. Those physicians who favored more traditional medicines and a conservative approach could therefore quote Hunter to justify their treatments. On another occasion, however, Hunter suggested that extirpation or ovariotomy might be a viable treatment, and thus he was also used as an authority to justify the more radical surgeries beginning to occur in the 1800s. In another example, for one physician, because a patient had gone through a difficult labor prior to diagnosis with ovarian dropsy, it made sense that the disease had taken root and the labor was blamed as the cause. For another physician, the difficult labor actually meant a woman was less likely to develop dropsy after, um, as they believed that not exercising the woman's proper role of childbirth was what led to the disease. The relationship between dropsy and pregnancy also provided fertile ground for a physician to control the narrative of disease by placing blame for the death on the patient and her behavior. Cases ending in death were attributed to a woman's body being difficult to diagnose, or her honesty being called into question, or some aspect of her behavior being immoral or improper. One Lancet article claimed that a woman was convinced that she was suffering from dropsy and sharply rebuffed the physician each time he suggested she might be pregnant. She begged him to be tapped and he gave in, despite his belief that she was pregnant and the general taboo um, against tapping during pregnancy. The physician claimed it gave her no relief, and he was proven right when her labor pains came on within four days. The case write-up placed the blame for pain and wrong course of treatment on the patient, and the physician downplayed his role in the tapping while still pointing out that his diagnosis was correct. In another example, medical men uh, battled through letters in the Lancet over the cause of death for a young patient of pious reputation and unmarried. Several physicians, unable to curb the advance of the dropsy, decided to proclaim her pregnant in order to save professional reputation, according to one physician. Another physician who had not even been present, but had a good reputation himself, stood up for the colleague accused of misbehavior. He wrote that the patient herself started the erroneous version of events and was trying to blame the physician for her own wrongdoing. In this episode, the physician under suspicion was able to displace blame onto the patient for misdiagnosis and rely on the reputation of his colleague to escape censure. It was even easier to blame a non-pious patient for their disease. Habits of excess, indolence, or suspected sexual impropriety were related in various cases to the cause of dropsy. At St. Bartholomew's Hospital, an unmarried young woman who had suddenly entered on a very irregular course of life admitted that her generative organs had been greatly overtaxed. She was attacked with abdominal pain and the practitioner found it very natural that suspicion at once should have been turned toward the ovary. Um, her sexual morality led to her disease, and in this case, the physician wrote that if the patient had only been more honest with him about what her improprieties had been, he could have cured her. Uh, finally, even as ovariotomy began to be more widely accepted, women took the blame for another outcome of the surgery besides their deaths. If they survived, removal of the ovary led to ungendering of a woman. She lost her womanly shape due to the dropsy and then never regained it when the ovary was removed. Her inability to maintain a feminine figure or produce children after the surgery meant that she had little value uh, to society. The question still remains in medicine today. How do we deal with the problems exposed during a chaotic period without medical progress uh, as seen in this study of ovarian dropsy? Thank you, Katie, for your compelling insights into the 19th century perception of women's medical concerns. Our next speaker today is Dr. Stephanie Montgomery. Dr. Montgomery is an assistant professor of history and Asian studies at St. Olaf College. She will be presenting her paper, A Den of Monsters, Women, Crime, and the City in 1930s China. Thank you for that introduction, Lisa. So my talk today examines writers in the popular press in 1920s and 1930s China who wrote really pointedly on the pervasiveness of crime in cities and supposedly the dire problem of women's crime. And my argument is basically that this body of writing um, is really historically significant because it pulls in these two more well-known conversations about the status of women in 20th century China and the increasing authoritativeness of science as a lens to view the entire world, and we might even say a kind of scientism. So popular writers drew from both of these conversations um, to analyze women's crime, and the result was that criminalized women were perceived as victims of Chinese patriarchal society, 
um, but also biologically inferior um, to their male counterparts and hence more prone to crime. So I want to give a little bit of background first um, to what's going on in China in the early 20th century um, and a little bit more on these two big conversations in relation to crime and finally, you know, what popular writers were actually saying. Okay, so first, so what's going on um, in early 20th century China? So um, the last imperial dynasty um, of China, the Qing dynasty, ended in 1911. There was a revolution and the establishment of the Republic of China. Um, and so in 1911, you often hear about the Republican government or the Nationalist Party as the head of this, but really, Initially, power was primarily in the hands of what came to be known as local warlords or local governors um, with armies. Um, and it's not until 1928, actually, that the nationalist, um, the nationalist Party is able to you know, really maintain control and kind of wrest power from um, these warlords, at least in cities. Um, so it was an incredibly unstable situation of nominal and weak power and control. Um, that was primarily in cities that were still experiencing a lot of trouble with poverty and crime. So these two conversations then, the woman problem and um, the question of science. Uh, so at the same time in the early 20th century, intellectuals and writers, and um, including in the popular press, were really concerned about this so-called woman problem. So what was the woman problem? Kind of inspired by, as historians have documented, um, the woman question of Europe. Um, from the Renaissance onward. Um, and in early 20th century China, this phrase really comes to refer to concerns over the status of women as uneducated, as illiterate, as footbound, and as economically dependent on men. And because women were still the primary caregivers of children, um, this also led to concerns over the future of China, the Chinese race, um, and the nation state. And so again, we see this kind of duality where women are simultaneously victims, right, of um, uh, Chinese patriarchal traditions, but also they are then to blame for China being unmodern and supposedly lagging behind other modern nations. So the science part of this conversation um, is also happening in intellectual circles. Um, intellectuals are championing the values of Mr. Democracy and Mr. Science, as they um, term them, to replace traditional Confucian values and worldview. So science had this kind of status, and its application to human affairs was really appealing in this tension between the traditional and the modern. Um, by the 1920s and the 1930s, and that's kind of the period I'm interested in, um, there's this really robust social science conversation happening about crime and um, within that, a subset on women's crime. So um, the so-called criminal or problem women within this larger woman problem in society. So Chinese social scientists are concerned with why women turn to crime, especially in urban spaces and cities. Historians have shown that they perceive those as very dangerous. They focus on lower class women and especially their vulnerable status um, within that social structure. And they're really influenced by um, you know, the University of Chicago, um, Chicago School of Sociology and Research out of Columbia that begins to center the structural social causes of crime as opposed to some earlier research um, that we might call criminal anthropology um, that looked especially at biological um, and physiological reasons for crime. So where do popular writers fit into all of this? Well, writers of the popular press in the 1920s and 30s, they were actually kind of well-read, surprisingly. They also argued um, for these kind of structural and social causes after reading um, and being very turned into, attuned into the Chinese social science literature. Um, so they argued that women had lower status in the family, poor women had to labor outside of the home, um, and they were more vulnerable to things that were labeled crime like sex work. Um, and they were also very suspicious of cities. And so the, the title of this paper, A Den of Monsters, is actually inspired by a quotation from a Japanese writer who was translated in the popular press in Shanghai, who called Shanghai a den of monsters and was worried about crime. So although popular writers acknowledge those social structures, on the other hand, they also put forth a lot of arguments that women's crime was connected directly to 
um, female biology. And so the notion that women were more likely to commit crimes during menstruation or pregnancy, that crime was tied to women's emotional and psychological states, their sexual lives, their physical appearance, their marital status, their fertility, and how many children they had had. This is all part of the landscape of um, how women were supposedly more prone to crime. And what's interesting and most significant, I think, historically to me, is that these popular writers, they really um, cited this diverse, local, and kind of global, and surprisingly kind of cutting edge research to create this patchwork of evidence in their writing. And this ranged from, you know, like we said, serious sociological studies from Chinese scholars. Um, so they were very turn, tuned into that um, social science discussion. Um, they knew all about that literature, they cited it. But they also cited uh, racist science from Japanese researchers who were looking at Ainu women versus Japanese women mid-century, you know, European criminologist writing, so kind of more that criminal anthro anthropology writing like Lombroso, and to some extent, uh, 20th century U.S. sociologists. So they were pulling in all of these different conversations on crime, um, and you might not expect that kind of breadth from writers of the popular press, but in a way they were extremely well read, and I think that um, that kind of signals and interest in science, but the conclusions that they ended up drawing were, I think Chinese social scientists would say, a bit dated. So just a few kind of thoughts, you know, to conclude here. What is important about this conversation? What was the result? Well, first, you know, we've said that it fits into these larger conversations that were really important in early 20th century China. The genre of heated debate about the woman problem, and then also this global conversation on science bordering on kind of scientism. So popular writers conclude that women's crime is a threat to the domestic sphere, but not only that, the Chinese race, the future of building a modern Chinese society, and they pull on these conversations to kind of make their point. And it's striking to me that the conversations and their conclusions are, are really not new, right? I think we can think of a lot of examples, especially in, in patriarchal societies historically, and this is the case for China and others, in which women are simultaneously pitied, kind of protected for their vulnerabilities, but then also blamed um, for domestic and even social problems. And in this case, the stories and bodies of criminalized women were scrutinized through the lens of science or even scientism, and they became this warning or call to fix social problems in Chinese cities and in the nation as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for this incredible introduction to perceptions of women and female criminality in early 20th century China. Um, our final speaker today is Dr. Mel Britsky. Dr. Britsky is an assistant professor at the History and Anthropology Department at Monmouth University. She will be presenting her paper, Young People in the Chinese Great Leap Forward and its Aftermath, 1958 to 1962. Hello, everyone. My research today is about how records of criminalized children and young people in the People's Republic of China can help us understand how children and young people might have reacted to the disruptions and scarcity of the Great Leap Forward and subsequent famine, and how those survival strategies might have been limited by factors like gender. So the Great Leap Forward began in 1958. And it was a national campaign that impacted pretty much all Chinese people's daily social and material lives, including children. The goal of the Great Leap Forward was to take agricultural surplus out of the countryside and use that to fund industrial development for the country. So this was a fundamentally extractive campaign in the countryside. Now, in order to get as much agricultural surplus as possible out of the rural areas, the state was trying to get labor out of as many people as possible. And so for many families and for many people, for the first time, this included women. Women were now expected to work outside the home. And so this also meant that for the first time in many families' lives, the primary caretaker for children and the elderly was working outside the home during the day. Now, 
The state did take this into account as a part of the national campaign. So one of the other aspects of the Great Leap Forward was collectivization. Collectivization of agriculture, but collectivization of all aspects of life, including the creation of daycares for children. So this created a lot of changes and disruption in everyday life, uh, even before the famine began. Now, for many reasons, the state took more grain out of the countryside than was sustainable. So despite higher grain totals being reported to the state, the actual harvests in 1959 and 1960 were lower than usual. But the state still took grain from the rural areas in line with the fantastical projections that they had received, uh, in part to repay the Soviets for their aid to the industry and military. So this left behind far less grain in the rural areas than was necessary for survival. And so tens of millions of people died in the famine. Now, even healthy adults were vulnerable during this time, but the young and the old especially so. The average age of death dropped sharply between 1957 and 1963. Now, we have relatively little information about how children and young people reacted and responded to the rapid changes of the Great Leap Forward and the subsequent famine. However, by using reports about criminalized children and young people during this time, we can glean some evidence about how children and young people might have reacted. So I'm using a report from 1960 in a northern city called Tianjin. Tianjin had a system uh, for misbehaving and criminal young people that included both work-study schools and juvenile corrections facilities. The majority of the incarcerated young people were boys and had committed theft, which suggests that these, the work-study schools and juvenile corrections facilities may have functioned as sort of de facto welfare institutions for young people. I have two cases that I want to talk about today. One is Bao Haoming, a 12-year-old boy who is incarcerated for stealing, and Zhang Yulan, a 14-year-old girl who is incarcerated for having, quote-unquote, adult relationships. Both of these names, by the way, are pseudonyms. So Bao Haoming was a 12-year-old boy who was incarcerated at the Tianjin Juvenile Correction Center in 1960. He was originally sentenced to 15 years imprisonment, an extreme sentence that was later changed to five years compulsory education. Now, Bao had apparently formed a gang to steal, mostly from peasant vendors that came from local agricultural cooperatives. The young thieves would take advantage of the market rush to steal. Now, as a part of the report, it is implied but left unspecified that Bao may have come from an abusive or impoverished household. In addition, the report does not comment on the fact that Bao's young age, he was 12 years old, and that is by the Chinese system of counting in the AMA. I can talk about how that's a little bit different than we might count age. So his young age likely should have kept him out of official sentencing and incarceration at the juvenile correction center. He was among 35 12 and 13 year old children at the Tianjin Juvenile Correction Center in 1960, out of an overall population of 631. So another young person who was incarcerated at the Tianjin Juvenile Correction Center was Zhang Yulan. She was 14 years old in 1960 when the report was written, and she had been accused of having, quote, adult relationships in exchange for food or money starting at the age of nine. Now, Zhang was among a minority of girls who were at the facility. There were 71 girls out of the 631. And the report gives very little information about these girls or about Zhang specifically. The report doesn't specify at what age Zhang was brought into the legal system and sentenced, what her sentence was, or what her fate was after the report. However, by looking at these two cases of Bao and Zhang contrasted, they give us a small window into the survival strategies that were available to children during this time of upheaval and deprivation, and that the strategies available to young people likely varied by gender. So it is possible that boys most often term, turned to theft to survive, and girls were more likely to sell sex or to be sold, which is also backed up by other research on other famines in China. So I look forward to your questions and the discussion. Thank you.
Thank you, Mel, for this fascinating look at youth criminality during the Great Leap Forward. I'd now like to thank all of our speakers again and invite them to join me in a discussion of the connecting themes between all four of their papers. To start us off, I'd like to ask all four of you if you could tell us a little bit more about what inspired you to embark upon this research, and in particular, a little more about the source material upon which your research is based. Are there any particular advantages about working with the records that you did work with, or any challenges inherent to these records? So what brought me to this research um, more broadly is that overall, right now, my primary research is about um, what type of childhood the state was trying to create um, during the early period of the People's Republic of China, so 1949 to 1966, and how families and children responded to these initiatives. Um, one of the issues is that there are relatively few sources that contain the sort of voices and experiences of children. The vast majority of the sources that I'm working with are state produced sources um, and then also archived by the state. And so looking at the reports and records of misbehaving and criminalized young people is one of the few areas in which we can see um, the responses and, of children and even learn a little bit about their experiences and the way that they are reported. So I was really interested in these reports because they are among the few that tell us about this, you know, relatively hard to understand area of life in China at this period. Um, the challenges are really the scarcity of sources and how very much is left unsaid. So I mentioned in the case of Zhang Yulan, this 14 year old girl, her case is mentioned so briefly. Most of the other um, reports are given a lot more detail. Like I know a lot more about the boys that are mentioned. She's the only girl that's mentioned and very little is given about her situation, her sentence, anything else. Um, and so a big challenge is really looking at such limited information and trying to use that to get a better picture of what was going on. Excellent. Thank you. Um... Stephanie, do you find working with Chinese records similar to the way that Mel finds them? Because I know that you're working more with literature, right? Well, yeah, I definitely am looking at some literary representations. It's interesting because um, I um, work with a lot of archival materials. Actually, my larger project and my, my more broadly speaking, I work on um, incarcerated women. And so kind of um, women's crime and studies of women's crime is a little slice of that. Um, and so my work is very, very archival based. Um, and I really like this um, aspect, this little slice of my research, um, because I get to work with literary representations or with um, published sources, all of these sources that I'm discussing um, were published in the popular press, including actually, um, you know, those uh, Chinese social science studies. A lot of them, a lot of these academics, you know, wrote in academic journals, but also in the popular press. And so it gives a little balance to my research to see those um, published sources. Um, and because that has been one of the challenges of working in the archive, um, especially with things like prison records, in um, you know, a very Foucauldian way, they're all very individuated and these kind of statistical you know, sources and it's hard to see the kind of the humanity and the narrative in that. Um, and so I really enjoy working with these published sources that give you kind of more of a story and a narrative to follow, even though a lot of these narratives, at least with the popular writers, are, are quite uh, problematic in the way that they portray women's crime. Excellent, thank you. And so, on to Katie. How do you find working with the Lancet as a source? It was uh, not my intention originally. It was meant to be a peripheral source because I was really looking for women's voices who were going through these situations and dealing with the medical um, field at the time. I was really interested in this big gap um, between major sets of quote unquote progress in medicine. Um, and so that's why I was looking at that particular time. And it, it just happened that the Lancet had begun to publish then. And so it was a very clear window into sources from all over Britain um, and also focused a lot on the hospitals in London. 
Um, and, and it was all of these voices of, of medical men um, talking about their experiences with the disease. And that's really what, uh, you know, the, the sources guided my, my research and my, my topic. And I never, you know, I have not been able to locate, um, you know, much like Mel, there, there's a massive dearth of, of sources from the women's point of view, but you can, you know, imply quite a bit from what you, uh, what the men have to say about it. Um, I also used uh, case books from hospitals um, from the same time. I did find the case books of one or two doctors who were writing to the Lancet. So I compared and contrasted those to see how the cases were treated in the kind of cold, hard facts you see in the case book versus the narratives constructed in the Lancet. Fascinating. So Adam, I'm going to ask you a similar question about working with your sources, because it seems like you worked with letters and song and other kind of popular culture type sources. But then I'm going to open it up to all four of you to sort of give any other thoughts that you have on, on what it's like to work with particular sources as a historian. So my work on this topic actually, um, it, partly it's kind of an extension of a lot of the research I had done uh, for my master's thesis, but the, the actual sort of impetus of the question was from a question on Ask Historians. Um, somebody had asked if anyone had ever claimed to be the person that had killed Edward Pakenham, who was a, an English general who was killed at the Battle of New Orleans. And I looked into this and mostly, you know, the, the answer was going to be like, yeah, well, nobody, they didn't really think about battlefield death quite that way, right? And I started researching and I found this massive, massive um, sort of literary kind of record about how the deaths of these men are treated. And I found that most of them reference each other all the time. So when we're looking at like uh, the death of General Montgomery during uh, the American attempt to capture Quebec at the beginning of the Revolutionary War, um, his death in Quebec is in nearly every single source directly related to the death of Wolfe, who had died at Quebec just a couple of decades before, like down to repeating the same sentences. And so this kind of like richness of the literary tradition sort of made me project this into kind of more of a, a structural thing, like how how is this meant? Um, in a sort of a wider scope. And so that led to rereading re the journals that I had read for my thesis and rereading some of the letters that had been collected. Um, and then, of course, contrasting that to the, the treatment of indigenous people who, who are the subject of this very intense but very different scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, and the harder part is working with the, um, the records of the indigenous, obviously, because almost all of them come from the white perspective. Uh, and almost all of them are concerned with things that are about the white experience, right? They don't care about the indigenous experience. That's not really the questions that are being asked. Um, so it was kind of frustrating and difficult to to deal with it in such a, a single perspective sort of a way. And um, I would have really loved to have found more uh, record from the, the indigenous perspective in any of these wars. And um, there unfortunately just isn't much. Uh, there's quite a lot of it that has been written about King Philip's War. Um, Jill Lepore's uh, The Name of War is kind of the seminal um, sort of study in this kind of structure. And it's, it's incredibly good. And I encourage anybody to read it because I think it'll just make anyone who reads it a better historian. Um, but, uh, it, you know, even the, the fact that we have such a dearth of the one perspective tells a story, right? It's something that we can interrogate and we can scrutinize uh, because this was a one-sided story um, and it, it connects again to to politics. So, I mean, if I spend any more time on this, I, I probably would have had a, a much harder time having any kind of coherent narrative because there's just so much of it. Sounds like a good potential PhD project. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then... I'm just going to open it up to you guys. Do you have any final thoughts about sources or what it's like to kind of approach that and look for those hidden voices in the narrative? I can say a little more about um, the, the topic in question, which I, I didn't spend too much time on in my paper, you know, being able to define what ovarian dropsy is, is quite difficult because you know, the, the process of medicalization was happening, the process of making it a profession and defining disease and, and trying to identify mechanisms and all of these things were happening in the time I looked at. So every physician had a different terminology they preferred to use. 
and a different um, understanding of what ovarian dropsy meant. So you know, kind of had to be purposefully vague for some of my research. I had to look for about 10 different terms to try to identify when people were talking about what I was interested in. Um, so, you know, thank goodness the Lancet has such a great online database now that enables that kind of thing. I don't know if I could have done my research um, in any sort of way that would have taken less than like five or six years, <laughs> um, you know, before the, the advent of the internet. Um, so. Thank you. So I think I'm going to move on to the next question then. One of the most prominent themes that really shone through each of your papers was the theme of historical propaganda. As an historian, how do you deal with propaganda in your sources? And do you have any thoughts about how we in the 21st century can approach and respond to propaganda in our own daily lives? This is again, uh, sort of an extension of a lot of my thesis research, which was looking at um, records of the War of 1812 that specifically dealt with the militia. Um, and what I found that was quite a lot of the people who had written about the war as participants did it decades later. Uh, they did it in the 1820s and the 1830s, and they did it as part of their own um, political aspirations. Um, some of them were actually like dueling narratives of the War of 1812, where somebody had written something that said, well, this guy made a mistake in this battle, and that's why we lost. And somebody, had, so that guy wrote a book in response saying, no, it wasn't my fault. It was the malicious fault. Um, and th these things are, are obvious propaganda. Um, and, you know, if you read past the, the couple of sentences that might be relevant to the research, it, it's very clear that these are, um, well, I call them ego documents. And unfortunately, in the, the vast kind of historiography of the war, that isn't really interrogated all that much. It's just taken more or less at face value. And I think it's, it didn't seem to be to be extra work to, to really interrogate these sources and kind of see what, um, what their overall point was and keep that in mind as I was reading, because I think that's essentially the goal of any historian is to is to ask, where does this come from and what is it arguing? And what are maybe the kind of um, the were structural aspects of, of power that are being bolstered or or criticized uh, in these sources? And um, especially when taking this and kind of applying it to a, a white versus indigenous uh, perspective, that becomes even more obvious, um, right? Uh, we have literal bodies being desecrated on one hand, and then the, the memory of even enemies being venerated on the other. And it's, it's this very extreme dichotomy um, that is, it, it just warrants, again, a much, much closer reading of, uh, of the sources that are treating the deaths of very similar people in, in these totally, completely opposing ways. Um, and, uh, you know, that propaganda essentially works its way into the popular culture and that popular culture references itself, right? I talk a little bit about songs, but we can also talk about like modern podcasts or modern struggles, especially with, we look at uh, Native American mascots and the politics that surround that. Or if you ever hear reference in a movie or a podcast or a ghost hunting show about Indian burial grounds, and it's, it's all these same ideas that, you know, a hundred years ago were part of a guy's attempt to become the president. Um, and then we're still dealing with those today because that that kind of propaganda power is so omnipresent. It's so forceful and it's so unquestioned for the most part. I can also speak to that. Um, one of the things that was, uh, you know, that, that pushed me into the area I was looking at is, is kind of our ideas about the conception of failure. Where does failure fit into the medical field? Where does failure fit into our lives? Um, because I think we find a lot in modern life that you spend a lot of effort trying to cover up mistakes or shortcomings and and treat things like everything is is going well <laughs> and things are you know happening just the way you expect them to and so that kind of idea of you know this one this one great thing that's going to fix everything or this one great thing that will make everything go the way you expect it to is very appealing and that's a very you know propagandized kind of idea but there should be a place for failure um, in our lives or, or mistakes or shortcomings. And so, you know, I, I feel like in, in class, certainly I'm encouraging people who hear that kind of narrative, everything is wonderful. Um, you know, we're making great progress here. I can cure this incurable disease, you know, that, that those are the kind of things that should set off warning bells. There's something else going on under there um, because, you know, failure is really part of, of, of every aspect of the human enterprise. Um, and, uh, and I think it's still a problem 
uh, for the field of medicine today to be dealing with that um, that kind of notion? How how can it fit into our understanding of what doctors do? Because people lose trust, um, and and you heard a lot in my paper about them trying to control the narrative to preserve that trust. Um, and discussing failure was not any part of that. I think I can speak to that a little bit too, um, Katie. I think that's really interesting, the the notion of, of failure. Um, and I think where I'm seeing a connection um, in our work is, um, you know, the kind of proposed solutions, right? So whether it's um, doctors that are treating, um, you know, women's reproductive issues um, or suggesting that, you know, women need to be incarcerated, right? For, uh, to kind of cure the ill of crime. And I think that those solutions, um, those institutional solutions, whether that's within, you know, um, uh, medicine or whether that's in criminal justice, um, they're really informed, yeah, by these anxieties over women's bodies um, and women's status and role uh, in society. And so those anxieties over, um, you know, who's going to produce these future citizens and the way that that informs, you know, propaganda from the nation state um, about what women should do with their bodies. Um, and thinking to kind of contemporary issues that relate to that, especially, you know, in China, um, the, the term leftover women, right, in recent years that was coined by actually the All China Women's Federation, which is, you know, the official um, party group that is supposed to deal with women's issues and support um, women and help women um, with, you know, these kind of social struggles in Chinese society and to term uh, anyone over, uh, you know, a certain age um, in their late 20s as leftover women who, you know, aren't going to be able to find a marriage partner and are they going to be able to have kids and this is a huge problem for Chinese society. I mean, to me, that really resonates with these anxieties over women's bodies and their status and can feed this kind of propaganda. Yes, I totally agree with that. I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, and I would just add Lita Hong Fincher has written about the leftover women phenomenon really well. Um, so that's another good recommendation. Um, yeah, I did left this out of my paper, but during the Great Leap Forward, there were storybooks, like one that I found from 1959 called A Bowl of Soybeans. And the storybook is about this girl whose grandmother steals some soybeans for, from the collective fields in order to give them to her granddaughter because it's her granddaughter's favorite food. And it's framed as a sort of question of loyalty for the little girl. Should she report her grandmother um, or, and be loyal to the uh, Red Scarves, the Young Pioneers as Communist Youth League organization? Um, or should she not re report her grandmother, who's her primary caretaker? Um, but one of the most sinister aspects of this is that all of this is taking place, but the actual context is left totally unsaid, unwritten about that that is happening in the time of serious famine. And any reader who is reading this would have known that the context was her grandmother was stealing soybeans, not because they were her granddaughter's favorite food, but likely because she wanted her granddaughter to have food and survive. And so adding in the historical context can really, I think, help one better understand what kind of narrative is being constructed and why and what kind of power structure is it upholding? And I, so I think, yeah, adding in historical context or even if we bring it to a more present day scenario, just adding in context is really important. Definitely agreed. Does anybody have anything else they want to say about propaganda or shall we move on to the next question? We could talk about propaganda for a long time, I think, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you've got some great questions, so. In that case, I'm going to move on to this idea that there's another common theme in the papers, um, and that is the impact of science, or what may even be termed pseudoscience. And I wonder if the four of you could talk about how that impacts your papers a little bit more, this idea of the sort of advent of science in the 19th century and how it's used to inform perceptions of the subjects of your papers? Well, I, I was thinking as we were talking um, a little bit earlier that, um, you know, kind of this idea of, of, of failure that I mentioned is also part of scientific enterprise. That is, that's part of the scientific method that if something you do doesn't work, that's just as important or helps advance knowledge just as much as something that does 
you know, it's, it's a result that, that gives you information. Um, but it's really difficult to deal with that in, in the area of medicine, because that's often people's lives that are struggling in that moment to deal with it. Um, and so science is being looked to as an authority. Um, I believe Stephanie you know, was talking about this in her paper too. Um, it's, it's this kind of beacon of hope for people um, that these medical men will be able to, to fix the problems. There's definitely something to be said for the fact, as, you, as, you, as you've noted, there's this rise of science and using science to solve these issues about of women's gynecological disease in this period. Um, and you do make a very good point about the, the connection there between failure and the scientific method, which I think is important to consider. I do feel like all four of the papers can touch on this. I mean, Adam, you don't really talk about science specifically in your paper, but mm -hmm. I think that you can probably speak to the kind of like racialization of science as well, how they're viewing indigenous people in this period versus yeah. like how white people are viewed by other white people. Yeah, and that's, uh, you know, something that I, I sort of deliberately left out of, out of the talk because again, it's one of these topics that you could go on for a long time uh, talking about, but I think mostly the 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 largest kind of piece of problematic science or pseudoscience that this touches on is is the idea of of um, what we call Whig uh, history, the history of progress, right? The um, the idea that way in the past every civilization started in this sort of um, you know what Marx would consider like primitive communism, and then we go through these stages, and these stages are recognized and they're universal, and um, we even see these ideas filtering into like Star Trek, right, where they go to a planet, it's like oh, it's it's this they're at this level of, of technology or whatever, and those ideas were all constructed during and in complicity with imperialist and colonialist projects, right? They were they were done as a means to justify. Uh, placing colonies and exploiting indigenous workers and exporting slaves from Africa and doing all these things because, well, we're just more civilized. We being, you know, the, the white sort of colonial hierarchy. And, you know, that, that idea becomes reinforced through these actions and through the, the way that the, these actions are framed and spoken about and how they filter into the pop culture. So again, we have this kind of line in the play where they talk about, so once in years gone by, the mammoth trod Kentucky's wilds as some superior god. And this is a, a line in an, just a few lines above um, the, the description of the death of Tecumseh uh, himself, sort of relating him to this, this mammoth, this, this thing that's out of time, um, that doesn't, it doesn't have a parallel in, in modern day because it's, it's dated, right? It's an anachronism. It's something that doesn't need to or deserve to exist. And so the act of death civilizes Tecumseh, right? And this kind of ties into these ideas of, of scientific, quote unquote, racism. Um, the idea of the warrior race that we can see over and over and over in colonial projects, you know, talking about the Maori in, in New Zealand, or talking about um, the, the kind of first initial idea of the, of the noble savage uh, had come from a white writer writing about uh, a, Moorish, um, a Moorish man or Moorish character. Uh, and so this sort of permeates this kind of this whole experience of, um, you know, Western Europe as being the core and everything else being the periphery and the core, of course, being the most civilized uh, part of the world and everything else sort of a couple of stages behind. And so all of this stuff goes to justify lifting all these areas out of their uncivilized savage past. And so you can really you can rhetorically justify just about anything. And of course, you know, in the short sightedness of all this stuff, the idea is initially just to justify like the invasion of Canada and the, the attempt to to conquer Canada. Um, but it goes beyond that because, uh, you know, we immediately see all, at least all of these sources that I'm using are coming from the 1820s, the 1830s, the 1840s. Uh, this is around the same time that uh, James Fenimore Cooper is writing The Last of the Mohicans. It's around the same time that all of these kind of plays are concentrating on the same idea of this dying and disappearing race that becomes codified even into American law in the 19th century. Um, and it's all based on these sort of, this infinity mirror of colonial projects attempting to scientifically justify their exploitation and the pop culture that reflects that, that is seeking to justify these very short term efforts. Um, and it's, 
it's pernicious and it's hard. It's kind of hard to extract because we're still living in within that structure that kind of maybe scientific papers and anthropologists and historians don't see it this way, but the popular popular culture certainly does. And I mean, any of us with experience on ask historians can probably see every day how many questions come up that are kind of framed within this understanding of history. Um, and it's, it's really tough because it's sort of like uh, killing our darlings because we look at the enlightenment and the Renaissance as being this, this moment of progress. And it's still within that framework of, okay, it's one more step higher up the ladder of civilization and criticizing that uh, can be difficult um, because that it attacks even the foundations of what we understand of as science. Uh, and it, it can get really tough to kind of extract something meaningful without, without looking like it is attacking kind of the basis of Western civilization. <laughs> right. And it's tricky. It's tricky to balance. Yeah. I, I would add to that too. So that, that definitely resonates with um, my research and, and from a kind of different perspective in which, you know, these Chinese intellectuals that were really worried about the woman problem um, were viewing themselves from this kind of like racial hierarchy that had been imposed, right. By, um, uh, you know, Western imperialist, um, hierarchies of race. And so these anxieties of what will happen, right, to China, what will happen to the Chinese race, and then that also becomes applied to gender, right, where um, women are um, then kind of cast as the evolutionarily inferior, the evolutionary inferiors of, of men, right, and that um, they are kind of have these more like vestigial traits or, you know, these um, kind of more Emo like they're more emotional or they have, you know, these kind of psychological issues that are not quite as developed, right, as, as men. Um, and so I think that that, yeah, maps on in terms of um, race and in terms of gender. I don't know what else I was going to add to that, but I think that that really, that it's a, it's a really interesting conversation and like depending on what part of the world you're, you're looking at, but it remains, you know, kind of um, relevant nonetheless. Yeah. Looking at Chinese history then from the communist period after the communists have managed to, um, or it's p the post-colonial period. And so they definitely view the world through this Marxist developmental theory framework. And so the idea is, okay, we're now in the socialist period. Of course, people who grew up, um, before socialism are infected by these feudal remnants and these other problems, but it is really vexing and frustrating. And also I think to a certain extent, mystifying to Chinese state officials when young people who've grown up under socialism still are committing crimes and doing things that the state thought would essentially disappear. And so that also plays into, I think, at least some of the obsession that I'm seeing with um, young people who just aren't conforming to state expectations that they have, again, because of this larger developmental idea about what stage of history they're at. Yeah, y'all, y'all have reminded me, um, you know, for the for the medical men in my paper, um, they see themselves as part of this progress, this um, transition in making the world um, a more orderly and understandable place. Um, but their frameworks um, included what Stephanie mentioned, the idea that that woman was a divergent type of man, that man's body was the ideal and, you know, problems that women had were therefore unique to their womanness and, uh, and kind of proof of inherent disorderedness. Um, to give you an example related to ovarian dropsy, uh, what was seen as the equivalent disease in men was testicular dropsy, so swelling for uh, the testicles, and that was easily cured by tapping. It did not have a recurrence. It did not often, you know, lead to death. But in women, you know, it was this intractable problem, and that was evidence for people of, um, of, you know, the woman problem <laughs> that you couldn't inherently deal with. That you know, it was it was part of what. Uh, um, what you had to deal with when, when looking at uh, a woman's body. So, um, you know, even though they're within that scientific realm, they're still subject to the overall paradigms. They're still subject to, um, you know, the other forces in society, which I think people tend to forget when they're thinking about science or thinking about medicine. It's not this monolith. It is affected by attitudes and ideas just as much 
as any other, um, you know, human enterprise. Something has occurred to me listening to all four of you answer this original question. And this idea may be fairly controversial, but the idea of, of science and progress is intended to be based in this idea about fact. But as we have seen in practice, it's not an equalizing thing. If anything, the focus placed on science and scientific progress really ends up historically damaging marginalized people more than it does helping them. And I'm wondering if you, if the four of you can kind of address this idea of how science is actually related to power. I think you've mentioned this a little bit already because the title of our panel is Power and, and Protections of Trauma. So I want to know kind of how you see this theme of pseudoscience and science relating to institutionalized power and how power is exercised with the subjects of your research. I mean, certainly for me, um, having authority and being able to have a successful career um, is often the principal concern of the medical men and not doing good science or finding solutions for their patients, although there were many who did. Um, you know, who did kind of put that noble pursuit as one of their uh, ideas in the forefront, but preserving that authority and that power um, as an individual and collectively as a group was extremely evident in, um, in the sources in the Lancet. Um, and so science was kind of in service to that and not being done um, in the idealistic way we might think of in the pursuit of knowledge, um, in the pursuit of uh, a finding truth or fact um, so that's, you know, that's what I mean when I say you have to examine medicine through that lens. You, you cannot disentangle it from, <laughs> from, from the power and authority needed to, to have success in the field or to have um, the kind of life that those medical men wanted to have. I definitely think in my research that science is, is a kind of power and that it, it um, wields a, a kind of power. Um, it, it's, I think it's pretty clear in the um, writings on women's crime and, you know, even the, um, the kind of foundation of, of social science, right, that we can apply science um, to society um, shows the power um, of science and the authoritativeness of science. Um, and kind of similar to, yeah, to medicine and um, medical institutions, uh, this becomes more evident in my research when I look at prisons. Um, and prisons in modern China, um, the modern prison um, versus, you know, just a kind of jail or a holding cell or maybe exile or corporal punishment. The modern prison is really founded on these ideals of science and really fetishized. The other thing um, that I don't talk about in this talk, but that I um, do talk about in my um, research more broadly is, um, you know, these uh, kind of writings in the popular press of people, observations of women's prisons. So people going to women's prisons um, and observing how clean and sterile and white and scientific everything is and everything is so orderly um, and kind of praising um, that. And a few, you know, detractors that are, uh, kind of note the lack of resources and that things maybe aren't going as well as uh, prison administrators would want you to think. Um, but overall, it seems to be uh, really about, yeah, the, the promise and, and science, again, as being a beacon um, in these uh, kind of institutions. And the prison is somewhere where uh, kind of the medical, right, and the carceral, they, they meet in that area. Yeah. Adam, Mel, do you guys have anything you want to add to this idea of the relationship between power and science and how, how that impacts marginalized groups? Yeah, I think... Um... The, the discussion of hospitals and discussion of what we, you know, the, the sort of Foucauldian, right, uh, model of, of what we view as progress, right, brings up kind of the, the, the grim reality of Indian boarding schools and reservations, right, because those were um, overtly about civilizing and about um, using up-to-date scientific methods to change the behavior of Native American people. And... So, you know, we have the boarding schools that are set up. You can't speak your indigenous languages. You have to speak English. You have to cut your hair. You have to behave in a certain way because those are the hallmarks of uh, civilization, right? Um, because all these other things are, are looking backward. They're acting backward. Um, and it even kind of uh, dates into kind of early discussions of um, 
of, of just the country as a whole, right? The, just the landscape in general is that it doesn't look like, you know, nice penned in fields and flocks of sheep or cows. It, it looks like a wild country, um, ignoring the fact that that wildness, that perceived wildness was something that was actively cultivated for different goals, right? It was cultivated to preserve hunting grounds and it was cultivated to uh, draw prey animals into certain areas so that you could hunt them better. And white Europeans just refused to see this. They, they saw it as a waste because that was wild. It wasn't improved. An improvement being cut down all the trees, you know, sow it with corn or whatever and start growing crops because that's the best use of the land. And, and so, you know, the part of putting indigenous people into reservations wasn't necessarily just to keep them in control and in a certain area, but it was to enforce certain behaviors. And those behaviors were perceived through the scientific lens as being the ones that are most, uh, that are more advanced. Um, and so it was looked at this almost like this um, charity project on, on the whole part of society in general. And you can see the sort of frustration from the white perspective that people just aren't behaving properly. Why, why don't, why can't they behave in a way that will elevate them the way that, that they ought to be? It's for their own good um, kind of a thing. And all of these ideas kind of trickle down from this sort of intuitive perception of science, but it even comes from professional scientists or quote unquote professional scientists uh, and politicians who are enforcing these things because this is the best use of X or Y. Um, and so we must, we have to go and use our superior technology and superior society to enforce this behavior to get everybody up to our level. Um, and it, it be, turns into this kind of paternalistic concern in the, the early 20th century about the disappearing race, right? They're disappearing. So we have to go preserve it. And it's, it's our sort of act of charity to do that rather than the cost of, <laughs> of our own um, you know, extirpation behavior, the cost of, of, of civilization, quote unquote. And Mel, do you find that this that speaks to, to your work with criminality in youth as well, in terms of how the Chinese state is framing a sort of science and progress with the Great Leap Forward? Because you did mention that they're perturbed that people are still committing crimes. Yes, very, um, which does not fit with the overall worldview about what human nature is like and what was hoped for after the establishment of socialism in 1949, the beginning of the construction, I guess. Um, but I was also thinking about how it's very complicated to talk about science and power and how that's all operating during the Great Leap Forward because in some ways, science is sidelined in a way. Experts are sidelined during the Great Leap Forward very purposefully by the state, um, including experts in agricultural science and other areas. Um, but certainly if you think about um, knowledge and who is allowed to state the reality that they see and what it is like, mm -hmm. that even at the level of the peasants and local officials who are ostensibly, they're supposed to be the center of all of this, knowledge is supposed to be flowing from them, but in reality the system has really broken down during this period, and so it is unsayable to say the harvests are not as good, these techniques are not working, we are in trouble. This does become unsayable during this period, even though these local peasant voices are supposed to be at the center. And so I think what I was really thinking when I was listening to everyone is about how much having science or a system of knowledge aligned with power and authority, as it almost always is, how destructive that is, regardless of if it's masculinity in the patriarchal system or the state structure and government um, in, in this case. This, I think, is a really kind of compelling place for us to settle on our final thoughts because I like that little sound bit right there as the, as the end of think about what it means for the relationship between all of these things. So I'm going to turn it over to the four of you if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share and then I think we can wrap up this very delightful panel. Well, I would certainly like to say, you know, in our, in our discussion about power and science here and, uh, you know, kind of the misuses of science in a lot of ways, um, you know, I certainly don't think that anyone should take that as a discounting of the process or that science as a whole 
should be mistrusted or is not a valuable um, way of inquiry in the world. Um, but, you know, that's, that's what a historian's job is. That's why you need historians, because you, you need to examine the way that it's being used um, and who is doing it. You know, for every um, medical man I found in my research who was exploiting science, I did find another who um, was trying to, uh, to use their, their inquiry for, for the betterment of man. And we do have times where we, we see, um, you know, great advances, I mean advances, through, <laughs> through research and through application um, of the scientific method. But I, I do think there is widespread mistrust of science and that comes from its misapplication and not its fundamental nature. Um, so I, you know, that's, that's how I want to finish. Um, and also just to say that, you know, when it comes to listening to women, um, researching uh, further in gynecological fields, um, there is still some work to do. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions still out there about women's bodies and how they work. Um, you see it the period I looked at, and uh, it's, it's, it's tied up in, um, you know, lack of education about it, lack of information. Um, so I want to encourage everyone to, <laughs> to consider, um, you know, becoming more informed in those areas and, and supporting people who are interested in doing so. That is a, a great and important message, especially given current world events. Stephanie and Mel and Adam, if you guys have any final things you'd like to say as well. Um, I can say <clears throat> a couple of things that, especially with response, you know, to kind of, um, to echo, I guess, what, what Katie has said, um, that, you know, rather than a wholesale distrust of science or the application of science to, you know, different issues, just recognizing um, that science is no exception, right? We, that science um, is produced in a certain historical moment um, it is produced by humans who are part of a certain historical moment and that it is really no um, exception to bias um, and that um, it has been used as a tool and it has also been used uh, to, to kind of oppress and marginalize and it has also been something that, um, you know, has uh, really helped. I don't know if I want to say advanced now that we have that <laughs> kind of tainted <laughs> word, um, but has, you know, helped many people and I, I can't help but think of... Um, you know, we're talking about uh, things that are happening and distrust of science um, currently, but, um, you know, like the, the skepticism of like vaccines and that sort of thing um, that seems to be a little bit more prevalent and how, um, you know, one thing that was done in the prison um, was, you know, these kind of mass vaccinations and then cities got, you know, kind of mass vac vaccinations as well. Um, and so, um, in terms of kind of disease that that also really helped people, even though at the same time, you have to acknowledge that these people were incarcerated against their will, often for committing crimes that were um, a result of their poverty. And so I think that, um, yeah, there's something really important about acknowledging um, the benefits of science as well and not just discounting entirely and, and distrusting. I think, yeah, it's, it's very important to make this clear because I think that it is too easy to to see the criticisms and not think critically about the criticisms but as historians this is what we do um, Mel I'm gonna ask if you have any any final thoughts that you'd like to share and also going off of what uh, Stephanie just said too I was thinking about how important nuance is that things can be both and that the roots of science like, and the scientific inquiry can be racist and sexist and really exploitative and oppressive and terrible and violent, but also that scientific learning and knowledge is also important and has benefited many people and we should not throw out science just because some aspects of it have been truly terrible. So I feel like this acknowledgement of the both and, which I think also really ties into our propaganda discussion. So much of propaganda is about really simple narratives um, because simple narratives can be really convincing. And so I think that maybe another important theme that's come out of this is how important not only context is, but also acknowledging the both and 
of, of many of these and the nuance and complexity of what is going on in all of these different cases that we're talking about. Definitely, definitely. Which leads us to, um, Adam, if you'd like to weigh in, you started us off. Now, do you want to finish this up? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think one of the things that, that um, sort of researching this topic really kind of brought to the fore for me was <clears throat> the idea that people can kind of like air gap, but they can have this dissonance between uh, actions that they're taking and the sort of political importance or, or social importance or whatever that they're doing, right? So soldiers who are marching up and down Mindanao in the early 20th century may not think of themselves as sort of the enforcers of a racial hierarchy, but they do see so sing songs that absolutely say that, right? And so it, it kind of, it, it brings up this sort of uncomfortable acknowledgement that we have that popular culture comes from somewhere. These ideas that are kind of repeated sometimes thoughtlessly come from somewhere and they have uh, troubling aspects and they have, uh, they contain ideas and nuggets of ideas that can absolutely enforce ideas like racial hierarchy uh, or structural power or uh, any kind of other things like that, right? So as much as we can kind of say, well, you know, it's not really that harmful to have an Indian mascot for a football team, you know, those, those ideas came from somewhere and they're reinforced somewhere. And maybe in a hundred years, somebody can look back and they can say, well, that's, you know, obviously an element of this kind of problematic aspect of the culture, but we can say that now we just have to kind of be aware of it. Um, and that doesn't mean that anybody who likes a football team with an Indian mascot is a bad person, of course, but that these ideas were manufactured for a specific reason for a, at a specific time. And if we don't acknowledge that we can perpetuate that in, in really harmful ways today. This just makes, so my, a lot of my research relies on discourse studies and rhetoric studies and Foucault and this entire discussion just puts me in a really happy place. So thank you all of you for, for these wonderful insights. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and set us up for our conclusion. Thank you once again to all of our speakers, to Adam, Katie, Stephanie, and Mel. Today's panel looked at power and projections of trauma across the globe from North America to Britain to China. Papers looked at the marginalization of indigenous leaders, women suffering from gynecological disease, women in early Republican China, and Chinese youth during the Great Leap Forward. In addition to the speaker's papers, the discussion of a number of important themes ranging from propaganda to science and the relationship between science, power, and propaganda uh, has been illuminating and thoroughly enjoyable. On behalf of Ask Historians, thank you for sharing your research and your insights with us today. And thank you to our audience for joining us for the ride.